You are listening to The Message Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Nick. Coming from the studios of WCDB Albany, our live show is two hours once a week on 90.9 FM. We're dedicated to bringing you local, national, and global stories from an on-the-edge perspective. As always, our fade-in theme is Oceans, and the executive music producer is Marsh Sound. So enjoy. Following a national trend in the wake of water crises such as the one in Flint, Michigan, Woosick Falls in upstate New York is ground zero to a contaminated water supply linked with extremely high cancer rates. The story, for our sake, begins in 2013 when longtime Hoosick Falls resident John Hickey died of kidney cancer at the age of 68. John had worked at a factory in the town for 35 years which specialized in making performance plastics, the kind of thing you'll find in a plethora of consumer products. His passing, as well as the link between the factory and a chemical-ridden water supply, may have gone unnoticed were it not for John's son, Michael. The younger Hickey explains his role in jump-starting a conversation that still has Hoosick Falls residents wondering just how a water crisis could have occurred in their town. Um, well... I guess I got a little bit more of an extensive role in it. I um, I found the contamination um, by re- doing some research roughly two years ago is really when I started the process. Um, my father actually passed away three years ago um, this month, and, you know, a local teacher passed away um, a year after him. Um, and, and after that, you know, there's always a kind of a, a thought in our village that there's been a high rate of cancer um, and people have assumed that there was something in the water. So after the teacher passed away, um, I decided to start to do a little bit of digging to see if there actually was anything to it. What Michael Hickey found was perfluoroctanoic acid abbreviated to the much simpler PFOA. The man-made water and oil repellent has a history dating back to the 1940s and has been used in products ranging from non-stick cookware to microwave popcorn bags. And now, of course, the scary thing about PFOA. It's a carcinogen, and the Environmental Protection Agency advises that more than 400 parts per trillion of the chemical is too dangerous for human consumption or as the Associated Press reported it in January, roughly four teaspoons and enough water to fill a 10-mile string of rail tankers. As for Michael Hickey's home water supply, the out-of-his-pocket test showed PFOA at 540 parts per trillion. In a phone interview, he talks about the chemical and the accepted knowledge surrounding it. Um, you know, it, it's really been a sticky situation because of it being unregulated. Um, in New York Department of Health, um, really didn't know a whole lot about this um, when we started. Um, and, and I really, to be honest, I think they've really just been educated on it in the last few weeks. Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, that that's it kind of is what it is because there's 60,000 unregulated contaminants out there right now. So you can't expect them to know all things. Um, but, but the difference, I think, here with this chemical is that, you know, the science is already proven. Um, we weren't trying to recreate the wheel. Um, the studies that were done in DuPont, um, Ohio and West Virginia, you know, that they, they spent a good amount of time um, and money. I think it was $80 million on the science panel um, to prove the, the seven, you know, two cancers and, and five other um, associated illnesses that go along with it for that panel. So that was a little bit of the frustrating part. Um, you know, New Jersey has a regulation as well. So the EPA regional administrator, she handles New Jersey, New York, and I think the Virgin Islands and um, Indian nations. Um, and, and I imagine that PFOA will probably, at some point in time, be regulated across the country. Um, right now, I think mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit tougher um, to go state by state. Um, obviously, some states are, are harder to deal with than others. Um, getting 
you know, legislation passed and, and whatnot. So, you know, it, it's been a frustrating process, sure. Um, now, the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation uh, recently identified uh, St. Gobin Performance Plastics and Honeywell International as responsible for some of the PFOA in the town. And your father worked at St. Gobin Performance Plastics Factory for a few decades, right? Reading from these uh, articles? Yep, when yep, when he was working there, they didn't realize that, I guess, did, did he even know PFOA was a, uh, a byproduct then? Or they didn't really know the no, dangers of that? No, I don't think any of them knew. And, and to be honest, I don't think really even the Teflon industry knew, except for DuPont, until probably the stewardship program that rolled out, which was seven years ago, saying that it needed to be out of all of the main... Um, you know, mix that they used um, by the beginning of 2016. Um, so I, I don't think it was malicious intent by St. Gobain or Honeywell. Um, I think it's kind of one of those things that we're probably going to see more of, unfortunately. Um, you know, looking into each one of these chemicals and, and everything, it, it, it's tough to do. You know, and I think that they've actually changed their mix now from C8 down to C6, which there's kind of talk that it could be just as toxic as C8. But, you know, it will take a long time to catch up on the research with that. Hickey has undoubtedly elevated this personal grievance into a regional talking point in the realms of media and politics. It couldn't have been done, though, without the various anecdotal accounts from Hoosick Falls residents. In a December 2015 report by Brendan J. Lyons of the Albany Times Union, as many as five separately detailed cases of cancer in Hoosick Falls are mentioned, with even the town physician, Dr. Marcus Martinez, reportedly diagnosed with atypical carcinoid, an aggressive and rare form of cancer that afflicts only about 1 in 100,000 people. So obviously this is a very uh, personal case with you, uh, with your father passing away in uh, 2013 uh, from cancer, but as far as your relationship goes with uh, Dr. Marcus Martinez, um, has he been doing the research with you, or that was years so, ago? So, so what happened was, is I, he's been a family friend for a long time. He was my physician as well as my, you know, my dad. Um, and actually, my whole family. When you're in a small village like this, um, you know, you, you don't have many options for the physicians. Um, and, and Dr. Martinez, um, you know, has been practicing 14 years, and his father was uh, 40 years prior to him. So really, you know, they have a good grasp on what the, the overall cancer numbers are in who's it falls. Um, so when I started doing the C8 science panel and reading through it, I read about two hours a night, um, a lot of probably obscure articles and everything else, and I wanted to really feel confident enough on, to bring this forward and not really to waste anybody's time. So after about three months, I, I thought that there was enough there to send over to Marcus, you know, some other peer um, peer review articles and, and whatnot, and I asked him if he could look into them and see if he thought there was anything to it. And you know, he he um, you know accommodated my request, and he, he read through some of them, and you know, there was enough information there for for us we thought to go to at least to the mayor um, and the village board to see if we did do the testing for PFOA. Now, I, I understand that when you went to the mayor, it, it was reported in some stories, I think, in the Times Union, uh, Mayor David Borge. Uh, he didn't really let you test the raw water. Uh, what was that about? Um, he said that private citizens don't have access to raw water, um, which was, you know, kind of um, upsetting as I was a village board member at one time, and my dad was actually a village board member um, when he passed away. Um, actually a sitting board member when he passed away. So it was a little bit frustrating at that point. Um, but I guess, you know, legally, liability, I, I don't know if he talked to his counsel there. What do you um, think of his handling village. overall of the uh, whole crisis, I guess, the mayor's? You, you know, I, I think there's been frustrations throughout. Um, there's no question about that, and I'm sure that he was a little bit frustrated with, with us as well. Usyk Falls Mayor David Borge was quoted as saying in December, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a medical professional, 
what I can say is that I've been here since 1985. That's when I moved here with my family. I continue to drink the water, I wash the dishes in the water, I take a shower in the water. And he continued, is there a concern? Certainly there's a concern. If there wasn't a concern, we wouldn't be here now. As far as the corporate entities go, two companies with factories in the area have been assessed responsibility by the Department of Environmental Conservation. One is Honeywell and the other is St. Gobain, the latter of which was the company that employed John Hickey for decades. His son's thoughts on the 350-year-old French conglomerate, which made $54.5 billion in revenue in 2014. St. Gobain is a, you know, they're, they're an enormous company. Um, you know, they have 190,000 employees worldwide, 60 billion a year in sales, and 440 companies under their corporate umbrella. Um, you know, so I think that there was probably a process, um, you know, knowing what happened at DuPont. Um, you know, the, the money that's there, um, that there's tied up in legal fees and will probably go, um, for another 25, 30 years until all the cases are heard there. Um, you know, I, I think it it gets hard because everything is so litigious now um, and the legal process takes a long time. And, you know, St. Gobain, I, do I think they knew sooner? Yeah, I do. Um, do I wish they did more in the beginning? Yeah, the, the one thing I do wish is that in 2006, we built our brand new water plant um, that's only 400 yards away from uh, St. Gobain building. Wow. Um, at, at that point in time, I, I would have thought ethically, um, you know, you come knock on the door and say, hey, you might not want to put that there. Um, but, you know, also I do realize that the people that are at the St. Gobain and Hoosie Falls are probably are not the ones that are really calling the shots either. Um, you know, we're just one of the small, you know, plants um, of the, you know, the global monster, really. So, you know, it's tough. Um, and St. Gobain plays a really vital role to our economics in Hoosick Falls. Um, you know, so if, if they were to ever leave, it would really be devastating on our community. Yeah, it's like a catch-22 almost. Yeah, that's kind of where, where it came down to when um, I did the article with the Times Union. Um, we weren't seeing really the progress that we hoped um, at that point. And it was a tough call to do that article because... I knew what it was going to do to the community. Um, I knew that our property values were going to go down and people were going to be scared about losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the CEO stands by his words in the interviews that he said prior that, you know, he has no intentions of leaving Music Falls and that the jobs are safe. You know, but, but that's always a question, and I understand that. Um, it, it's basic. Cuomo uh, and the state have said they want to put $10 million forth uh, towards water filtration systems out of their Superfund. Uh, and is that just a temporary fix? And in your opinion, uh, how, how much do you think is needed to uh, help this problem? And uh, where do you think the money should be going? Well, uh, the, the $10 million the other day, um, he was saying that is going to be for trying to um, find a new water source on top of um, the additional filters that will go to the, the town residents. So in the village, we have roughly 3,500 people that are on the, on the water, but then there's another 1,500 people that are on private wells outside. So when he released that money, he was going to be providing for the private wells that are on the outside of the village as well um, mm -hmm. because of, you know, kind of we're not really sure exactly um, how far the contamination has reached um, you know, so kind of, I think that was, um, the play to make sure everybody in the town felt safe as well as the people in the village. Um, you know, 10 million, I think is just going to be a starting point. I think mm -hmm. it's going to cost a lot more than that by the end, uh, especially when we get into the blood testing and medical monitoring. Um, there's a lot to be done and, you know, 10 million seems like a big number, but it's really not. Um, for the, the kind of work that needs to be done here uh, to make sure that everybody feels safe um, in the community. According to the Albany Business Review, uh, Honeywell officials have been uh, meeting with state health officials to discuss their uh, participation, their potential participation in a program to secure the water supply of residents who rely upon private wells. 
Uh, do you think that uh, these corporate entities should get involved in the repairing process? Uh, and to what extent do you think they should, yeah, they should yeah, be involved? You know, I, I think if they're willing, um, they have the resources, um, and they have more accessible resources financially than um, maybe the government does as you know, taking care of the entire state. I realize that we're kind of a, a small little village and town um, on the overall scale of New York. So if Honeywell is willing to get involved to help the situation, um, I welcome it. Um, I think everybody should because, it, you know, when the news cameras go away and when, you know, the Department of Health doesn't have this every day, we still need to follow through on this uh, program and if Honeywell is willing to, you know, send somebody here or to help monitor the, the program or, or do whatever they can, um, I think that's a great thing. Michael Hickey never loses sight that the ice is paper thin with a situation like this. In a region where manufacturing plants have polluted water before and left when they were found out, with the prime example being the Fort Edwards General Electric plant, the risk of lost jobs against a healthy and informed populace is once again in the balance. Hickey comments on his town. And, and the tough thing about this, too, is that, is that we're, we're a blue-collar town um, all the way. And I think there's an assumption, too, that the lifestyle is a little bit harder, maybe, um, you know, the, the factory workers tend, you know, kind of labeled this way. It would be the smokers and drinkers and and maybe, you know, kind of that could be a reason for the high rates of cancer. Um, and I think maybe it was downplayed a little bit for a long time because of that. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't find this sooner. But overall, um, there's a lot of cancer here. Um, and there's a lot of people with... Uh, I've seen and heard a lot more thyroid issues than um, I would imagine would be normal. As for Hickey's thoughts on water crises like these across the country, as well as how to prevent water crises like these. Um, preventing these types of situations are tough because I think that they're use a lot of chemicals and in, in a factory town like ours, um, I think that our contamination occurred over 30, 40 years. Um, I don't think that happened overnight. Um, I don't think that St. Gobain was 100%, um, even Honeywell, all the way responsible. I think it would probably go all the way back um, to the beginning from when Dodge was here um, in the 50s. It, the, the, water, the water crisis across the country, it, it, it's tough because there's so many man-made chemicals that are out there now. And there, there's so much pollution that goes on as a whole that it's really hard to, you know, stop, um, you know, on, on a larger scale. Um, it, it's just, uh, I think it's just the world that we live in now, unfortunately, that these will continue to occur. If you could gauge uh, maybe the town and the village's uh, reaction uh, from many of your neighbors and community members, uh, what do you think it would be so far, as far as this crisis is concerned? Um, I think there was some frustration in the beginning, um, you know, that it took so long to get out um, from, you know, not just locally, but on the state level as well, um, and to get the correct information to the residents here. So the, the frustration there, um, you know, obviously taking 14 months to get to um, where we really are, you know, today, um, actually up a little bit further than we are today, um, 16 months at this point. Um, it, you know, it, it, everybody's scared. You know, there, there's their kids are here. Um, you know, it, it's a scary thing. Uh, knowing that your water can cause cancer, it, it's not something really to take lightly. Um, there's been some positive things that have came out of this with uh, the school, the students stepping up and, you know, really voicing their opinion. Um, you know, so it, it, I think there's a, a combination of a lot going on right now. Um, and, and hopefully as it gets ironed out, you know, you know, there's more of a sense of pride in the community that something was accomplished here and that we're going to be better in the long run. Um, um, yeah. You know, that's kind of the way I think that you need to look at it now. 
And if we could just um, end it with a uh, one final question, uh, when sure. do you when do you think? Uh, I know it's really really difficult to ascertain when this uh, crisis will be over, but uh, when do you think it uh, can be resolved? Yeah, and I guess just to add to that, uh, what what are the short term uh, solutions that are going to be pursued, and what what are the goals for the long term? Um, all right. Well, well, the short term, the temporary filtration system, I believe, will be up and running this week. Um, the longer term will be that a new water source will be found. Um, the plume will be identified um, for the contamination and, and where it is. So we would have clean water, um, you know, and, and still actually use the filtration system as well. So you're, you're going to have probably the cleanest water in the state by the time this is over. Um, but, you know, it, it could take a while. It, you know, I don't think that this is going to be over, you know, next week. It's probably going to take a few years to really get on a, um, you know, a platform where everybody is really feeling safe and, and is okay with their, their kids taking longer baths and taking longer showers. And, it, you know, it's a scary thing. Um, you know, and I think we're in the right direction now and we'll be better off for it in the long run. It's just a really tough process to go through. At, at this point, I, I think that we're, we're really heading, I hope, in the right direction. Um, that, you know, the finger-pointing stuff that happened prior, um, I don't think it benefits anybody. Mm. And, and I think that we're going to be okay as a community. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Well, uh, thank you so much for yeah, calling thank in, you. Mr. Hickey. That was uh, really insightful. Really insightful. Right, thanks for, I got you for having me. I appreciate it. Extremely special thanks to Michael Hickey for sharing his story with us. And as always, thanks to Marsh Sound for the music he's contributed to this episode of the Message Podcast. And you can find all his tunes on marshsound.bandcamp.com. The story on Hoosick Falls is one Nick and I will be following throughout our final semester here with WCVB Albany, which once again makes all this possible. Playing you out is Marsh Sound, a tune called Space Hop, so enjoy. Enjoy.